Hello and welcome to a cornucopia of tales and tellers. I'm Simona and I'm here with Alan. Hello, Hello. Alan. Hello, Simona. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. What about you? Pretty good. The sun is shining. Oh, here as well. And it's very, very hot. Is it hot there as well, Alan? It depends what you would define as hot. It is not Italian hot. It is cork hot. Okay, it's four, here it's, four, it's 14 30 degrees. degrees. <laughs> how, ma how many? 14. <laughs> 14? Yeah, one, is, four, 14. Here is 30, three, zero. <laughs> so, and I'm in the, shorts. <laughs> me too, but it's different kind of hot. So today, Alan and I are going to tell you two short stories. Uh, and uh, I think that for the first time, um, we are both going to tell a story from our country. So Alan is going to tell an Irish story and I'm going to tell an Italian story. So Alan, would you like to start and tell us your story? Certainly. So I have just come from the regional park, which has a fairy trail. Now, there are no skiaks or white thorn bushes in that fairy trail. They're all beech trees, but it's a really nice spot along the river where the otters are running around. So the fairies have decided to um, make that area their home. So you can take a walk around uh, the fairy trail here in the south of Cork. It's very nice. So what I thought I would do was to tell my very first experience with the fairies. Or was it? So back up in the Glens of Antrim, where my grandfather owned a farm and our next door neighbours also owned a farm, the Murphys they were called. What we used to do on a every other day basis was either they would come to our house for a cup of tea at night or we would go to their house for a cup of tea at night, which was fantastic because I had an excuse to play with the dog. And everybody knows collies are the greatest dogs there is. Um, so I always had a fantastic time playing with their collies on the farm. So there was one night we got into, it must have been a riveting conversation. I can't remember what. Um, just one of those nights where you get really into conversation. And we were there for quite a long time. I remember my granddad was sitting talking to Murphy. And he looked at the clock and it was about 10 to midnight. Now, my grandfather was always in bed by 10.30, extreme latest, always out of bed, 6 a.m. That's it. You had your dinner at 5, your lunch at 1, your 11 sees at 11, your breakfast at 7. That was the rules in our house for generations. Um, so the conversation must have been mighty that, that night. But anyway, he looks at the clock and realizes we're close to midnight. And he says, well, here, we'll have to go because we need to go to market tomorrow. And Murphy takes one look at the clock and then looks outside. I don't know what he was looking at and I don't know what he was expecting to see. But he goes, no, you won't. You'll not get home if you leave now. And his wife, Mary, put on the kettle for another cup of tea. At midnight? Really? Anyway, McGrunder protests. He says, look, thanks very much, but we need to go to market tomorrow morning. It's going to be a long day. Need to get a bit of sleep. Thanks very much, but we'll see you in a couple of days. Murphy says, you'll be back here in no time. And Mary herself, she was putting the kettle on the stove and says, well, sure, you'll be back here in five minutes, so these teas will be ready for you by then. I thought, well, here, that's a bit strange. But we went on our way anyway. So it was a lovely moonlit night. There's a wee farmer's lane between our farm and their farm. Well, this is up in the lens of Antrim, so it's quite bumpy. It's an old road, isn't you know, no tarmac, no street lights. But normally when the moon's out, it's quite a nice wee night. So we're walking along and we've we've walked this road a thousand times. You could walk it a thousand times in a year, never mind in a lifetime. We're walking down, and suddenly I put my foot into this giant puddle. Now it had been dry for a while, and I knew there was no puddles on the road. This is this is really strange. I went to lift my foot out, and I couldn't. I was a wee bit stuck. I looked at my grandfather, and he had sort of stopped in his tracks as well. He was a wee bit stuck in what we both thought 
was a puddle under her feet. And just then, there was a hand on my shoulder. And there was the other hand was on my grandfather's shoulder. And it was a lad behind us. Turned around. Massive big fella. He must have been seven foot something. Huge. And he says, lads, you're going no further tonight. You may go back that way because you're not going down the field. And there was a bit of a silence. Not even rustling, just silence. But my granda seemed to understand the situation. And he said, okay, very respectfully. We'll head back. We'll leave you be. I'm sitting in silence. What's going on? So the big fella went, okay, fair enough, and headed off India Bush through the hedge, which I thought was very strange. My grandfather turned to me and he says, come on, we'll go back. We'll get them teas off Mary. So we head back to Murphy's house, knock on the door. Before my hand could even knock on the front door, Mary had already opened the front door. She says, I told you she'd be back. Now, sure, there's the tea sitting there. Come on in. My grandfather walks in. He makes eye contact with Murphy. Murphy goes, ah, I told you so. I told you so. So I sat down and had conversation for a good while. The dog was still up, so I was still playing with the dog. I was trying to work out what was going on, but I quickly forgot. We'll get into the conversation again. But anyway. The time got to about two in the morning. Murphy looks at the clock. And he says, well, they'll be finished by now. You could be able to go on home now. My grandma goes, fair enough. Thanks very much for the extra tea. We'll head on now. Mark it in the morning. So we head out again. Walk down the road. Walk down the lane. There's nothing there. The puddle's not there. We walk home. My grandma heads straight for his bed. I just, I head straight for my own bed. Fair enough, says I. Didn't think I didn't have it. So I got up the next morning about six o'clock when you were in for a busy day with the market going to be on that day. I sat down to have my breakfast. My grandma sat down to have his breakfast. I was like, what was that? What on earth was going on last night? And who was that big fella that magically appeared behind us? My grandfather goes, oh, that's one of the fairies. That's one of the fairy tribes that have been living here for generations. You don't want to mess with them, lads. They were having a hurling match last night. I completely forgot to leave them be. You can't go up and down that road when they're having a hurling match. So that was my first experience with the fairies. I had no idea. We had generations of fairies were living in, on our farmland or were we living on their farmland and having a hurling match where we normally have the cows. So are all fairies uh, seven feet tall? Who knows? Um, <laughs> no. And yes, in Ireland, fairies aren't the Disney idea of fairies that is quite common. Um, that's sort of unfortunately sold to tourists as well. That's not what fairies are like. Sh fairies are shapeshifters. They could be anybody. They could be anything um, in their natural form. Who knows? But they're not little tiny people with wings on their back and dust in their wake behind them gold dust they're not they're not tinkerbells um but they're certainly not people you would ever want to mess with um they are they are the two the two of the Danon, so our ancient gods and they decided to move to the underworld so i certainly would not mess with the fairies in ireland and if they're playing a hurley match you leave them be but hurling is our That's one right. of our national sports and it has been around for over 5,000 years. So the fairies give it to us. There might be a few more stories in the future of what the fairies give to us or maybe what we stole from the fairies. Hmm. Mm. <laughs> and could you give a bit of background uh, on what hurdling is? Uh, I think not all of the listeners may be familiar with that. So I was having this conversation in Cork City Centre yesterday with one of our teachers, and we basically agreed that hurling is when you cross um, lacrosse, hockey and murder. Um, it is a 
5,000 plus year old sport played with a schlitter, which is the ball, which is basically a um, piece of concrete, really hard. You play with a hurley stick and um, it's played, all of the Gaelic football and hurling is played on a pitch, probably double the size of a soccer pitch. Um, and you score points by either hitting the schlitter between the posts, which is one point, or scoring a goal, which is three. Um, and is the fastest ball sport in the world. Um, and you do have to, well, nowadays you do have to wear protective headgear because it is possible that you might not survive. <laughs> Only in your head, uh, the rest of the body can be hit by the, the ball. The concrete oh, yeah. oh yeah, you're absolutely fair game. Yeah. Um there was a hurling match on, not by the fairies, by the humans, um, near me a couple of years ago. And one of the players, um, somebody hit him in the wrist with their hurley stick when he went in for a tackle um and broke his wrist. Now, normally when you break your wrist, the sensible thing to do is, you know, go to a hospital. He did not. <laughs> what he did was he duct taped his hurley stick to his arm. Um and scored about nine more points, and then he went to the hospital. Um, doctors apparently told him he nearly lost his hand, but he's a hurley player. <laughs> That's the logic. <laughs> Tough people. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, Simona, I do believe you have an Italian tale for us today. I do have an Italian story, and it's actually one of the few Italian stories I've ever told uh, since I started telling stories. Uh, so it's a special one, a rather special one for me. Brilliant. And it's Brilliant. not a, yeah, it's not a, per a personal story as yours was, uh, but uh, um, it's um, a folk tale. Nice. There was once a king, and he was a very good king. And one day, he decided that he wanted to know how the people in his kingdom lived. So he told all of his guards to be ready, because the following morning, they would go all over his kingdom to meet the people who lived there. And so they did. The following morning, they galloped outside of the palace uh, and they went all over his kingdom. The king was very happy to meet all of the people who lived there. And they came to a field where a peasant was working hard. And the king stopped and he asked the peasant, do you like your job? Yes, I do, sir, said the peasant. And to the king, how many coins do you earn? each day. Oh, sir, I, I earn four coins every day. Hmm, said the king, four coins. And how do you spend these four coins? Well, said the peasant, the first coin I eat, the second I give forward, the third I give back, and the fourth one I give as a thank you. Ah, to the king very interesting thank you and saying goodbye to the peasant he set off on his long journey but he was galloping with his guards and he kept thinking about the peasant's riddle he couldn't figure out what that meant he couldn't live with that thought so he stopped abruptly and he told the guards that they had to go back to the peasant and so they did. And when he went there, he asked the peasant, peasant, please tell me the solution to your riddle. Well, okay, said the peasant. The first coin, well, I use the first coin to buy food for myself. With the second coin, I buy food for my kids. So I give to them something that they will return to me when I am older. With the third coin, I buy food for my father, who gave me food when I was little, so I give him back what he gave to me. And the fourth coin, I used to buy food for my wife, giving her a thank you for everything she does for me. Wow, said the king, this is a really, really nice riddle. Well, peasant, 
promised me that you won't tell anybody the solution to this riddle unless you've seen my face a hundred times before because I want to ask this riddle to my courtiers and they don't need to find out the solution from you. Okay, said the peasant, I, I promise. And so the king rode back to his palace and when he, when he entered the courtroom, he asked his courtiers, well, a peasant earns four coins every day. The first coin he eats, the second one he gives forward, the third one he gives back, and the fourth one he gives as a thank you. What does he use his four coins for? And the courtiers tried to guess, but they couldn't figure out what that riddle meant. Except that one of them knew that the king had been seen speaking to a peasant that day. So he went to one of the guards and he made him promise that the following morning they would go and find that peasant. And so the following morning, the courtier and the guard set off on their long journey to find the peasant. And when they found him, the courtier asked him for the solution to the riddle. No, 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 said the peasant. I, I promise the king that I won't tell anybody the solution to this riddle unless I've seen his face a hundred times before. Hmm, said the courtier. Well, th th this is very interesting. I, I think I have a solution for to this problem. And so he took his purse from his belt. He opened it and he counted a hundred gold coins from it, each of them with the face of the king on it. He gave the hundred coins to the peasant, who in turn looked at each of the coins before putting them in the purse. And then he said, well, I've seen the king's face a hundred times. I think I'm ready to tell you the solution to this riddle. And so he told him, and the courtier went back to the palace and told the king that he had found the solution. And you can imagine that the king was very angry. How could you find a solution to this riddle? You have talked to the peasant, that treacherous peasant. He's a traitor. Call him. Guards, summon the peasant. And so the peasant was brought to the room. You, you are a traitor, shouted the king. You told them the solution to the riddle. Oh, oh, oh well, well, said the peasant, I, I, I'm not a traitor, king. I, I, I had actually seen your face a hundred times before I told him the solution to the riddle. Ah, I haven't seen you. Well, how could you see my face a hundred times? Well, said the peasant, and he took his purse from his belt and he showed the king the hundred gold coins. The king started laughing and laughing and laughing. Oh, you are such a clever peasant. Well done, well done, my friend. Okay, you're forgiven. But know this, that whenever I'll be in need, of some clever help, I'll come to you. And this is the story of the clever peasant. Nice. <laughs> have you heard that story before, Alan? Or was it I new? I don't think I have. Yeah, I think it's new. I think it's new to me. Yeah. So bef before we recorded, you had stated that you had edited bits of the story. Do you want to tell us a bit about that? Yeah, I actually did. Uh, I'm because uh, in the original version uh, of this story, uh, the the riddle is a bit different. Uh, so um, the peasant says, uh, uh, "One coin I eat, one I give forward, one I give back, and one I throw away." And the one he he throws away is the one he he gives to his wife. And I actually actually didn't like that part because uh, um, you know there was a bit of um, misogynism in that mm -hmm. uh, in that part of the story 
And so I, I decided to change it uh, and to make it into, uh, I give as a thank you. So because the wife actually does something for him. And so mm-hmm. he gives her the coin as a thank you for what she does for him mm-hmm. and not uh, as a, something that he throws away because uh, his wife is uh, um, useless. And uh, what, I, what I asked you before we started recording is, uh, is it uh, something I could do? I, I think I was entitled to do this uh, um, in this particular situation. But um, what I asked you is, uh, uh, how much can we change stories uh, to adapt them to our times? Uh, and is it uh, okay to do so? Yeah, I, th- I think the English teacher, when you were telling that, the English teacher in me as well is thinking king and peasant. Um, so it could, it could be modernized as well. But there is there is something nice about stories, folklore, fairy tales, where there, you know, there's a lot of them do have kings and princesses and princes and queens and stuff. Um, but then how is how are the average citizen of a kingdom referred to? Are they peasants? Are they plebs? Are they creatures um so it could be modernized as, again to also mm-hmm. discuss you know terminology of um general populations as well um what what would the modern day equivalent be a company ceo <laughs> and a employee or something he's leaves so. <laughs> Yeah, there's a there's another debate. There's another uh, terminology we could we could uh, debate. Um, but yeah, so before we recorded this podcast, we have we had sort of already planned in the future a storytelling debate um, to be the both of us and well, basically anybody who wants to join in. Simona, do you want to talk a bit about what we have planned? Um, and if anybody would like to get in touch to take part. Yeah, absolutely. So we were thinking that uh, we, since this is a very interesting topic, uh, both for uh, um, English teachers who use uh, stories in their classrooms uh, or for storytellers, uh, we'd really appreciate if uh, anybody listening would like to take part in this debate. And uh, we we won't be arguing, we'll just uh, debate uh, uh, about this uh, peacefully and uh, calmly. <laughs> well, not not heated arguing, but definitely <laughs> arguing certain points. Yeah, so we're we're quite ke- we're co- quite keen to get ideas and thoughts and theories and opinions on um, renaming or re um, telling old tales for the modern era. Is there terminology we should and shouldn't use? And then there's the whole debate as well about. Um, if you're from a certain country, would you attempt another country's naming methods um, and or um, colloquialisms um, as as the the resident Irishman? Um, there are there are obviously uh, infamous means of telling an Irish story, but what if you use our grammar or version of English or the names incorrectly is it still a is it still an Irish story? Who knows? Um, debates rage on, so we are quite keen to see everybody's opinion on that. Absolutely. So please feel free to contact us uh, either uh, via email or on Facebook. Uh, leave us a comment. Uh, uh, contact uh, uh, Alan or I directly, and. Uh, We'll be very happy to have you on the podcast uh, for this uh, debate. So thank you, everybody, for listening to another episode of A Cornucopia of Tales and Tellers. Thank you very much, Simona, for today's tale. Thank you, Alan, for yours. And I hope everybody enjoyed that. So if you want to get in contact, if you want to tell a tale with us, if you want to join in some storytelling debates, please do get in touch and we'll see you in the next episode in a fortnight's time. Goodbye. Bye.